Why um, are you in Dorset writing it? So I live half my time in Dorset yeah. and half in London. So I would go to Dorset regularly and collect a lot of information as I walked. And obviously I was born and grew up there. Yeah. And um, my mother still lives in the same house where I spent my whole childhood, which is wonderful because for me, I, it's, I can go to that house and it's, I just walk through my childhood the whole time. And yeah. I think that a lot of people don't have that because um, mums and dads move on and you move home. And so all of my childhood memories are still in that place, in that land. And, and very easily accessible. You, to when you say accessible, do you mean like um, inside you? Do you, you can access the state of childhood when you go yeah. back there? Like, is it held in the walls of the house, like the architectural uncanny in a way? Are you yourself haunted by an earlier version of yourself when you go back there? Well, I never felt like I ever grew up, really. I, yeah. I think, I, I don't know, I've... I, I feel like most people must feel like that, surely, because I do. I mean, I still feel like I'm in my childhood imagination at least half of my waking, wakeful life. That's a good ratio. Uh, <laughs> don't, you do feel you, the, don't you feel the same? I mean, I'm utterly childish. That might be a separate thing, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, I do. But, I, you know, I inside the old eye dying, which is what, how, what you write was in the book, that seems to me to suggest that there is this traumatic letting go, and obviously the book is, 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 is dark and tackles some difficult subject matter, but in, in a way that you turn into a kind of ecstatic survival of the girl, into, or girl boy, into, into adulthood. And that, that seems to me like um, a way of saying that all of us are better off haunted by the child rather than putting the child to bed, mm. putting it away, and that some of the problems of the adult world might be the denial of the child vision, both as a spiritual thing and as a physical thing. Mm. So I think that a lot of what Ira does in the woods is, is, your, is your sort of love song to the way of seeing the world as yeah. a child? Yeah, no, you've, you've, you've summed it up much better than I could have done. I think that's right. I, I think eight that... quid, please. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, yeah, I almost feel like the, our childhood, or I suppose I feel childhood, which is such a special and profoundly important formative time, and in our childhood, basically, that's the formation of who we become forevermore. But that part, I still feel kind of runs around and exists. And I think that's also why in this book, I wanted to create that world. Um, mm. So all of the ash wraiths mm. are all the childhoods that are still running around in those woods. Mm. So every child that ever played there is still there. I, which I think is the most beautiful thing mm. and absolutely true. I think that's one of the most realist things in a book that blurs the line mm. between the real and the imaginary. Yeah. And when, is that particular remember, to the woods, do you think? Um, I, no, I think it could be as to wherever one played, mostly as a child, whether it was in a playground or in an old quarry or, yeah. you know, wherever it was. And I think we all have those places that we played a lot as children. Um, and, the, you know, they might well be running around still there. And yeah. maybe are, but... I think, especially the, the older I get, the, the more I feel like it's still very much a part of me. Yeah. With the living in the dead, because one of the things I love most about this is that I, I am interested in, in the membrane between the two being thin and one past and the other and how we might be better haunted or more compassionately haunted by the past and how that might be repurposed in the present as depth of understanding or even kindness towards one another if we, if we don't think of the past as finished as we think of it all the time polluting our own senses. And you take that, what you do is, it's not as simple as is, he a, is Elvis a ghost, is he a figment of her imagination, right? You, you, you fully stick with the logic of her, of her it's a magic, right? It, it could be either, it could be that he's a figment of her imagination, it could be that he's a metaphor, it could be that he's a joke, it could be, it could be a way of winding her brother up. They're all the same. And similarly with the language, a dead language coming to life on her tongue in her linguistic play and in, her, in the kind of emotional framework of her childhood. There's no dividing line. Mm. Is that something that you think is, for you, not just an artistic thing, but also an emotional one? Do you want to be haunted by old languages, old ways of understanding, old folklore, old names for things because of a dissatisfaction with the present? 
or just because it's beautiful? Yes, it's not not because of a dissatisfaction with the present, but I feel they're they're all this, they're all one, they're all intertwined, and yeah, like you were saying, the past feels 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 present. It feels rich and alive, and the future, and uh, it's all in the mo in the moment. If you inhabit the moment, if you're really present in it, and um, I w yeah, I was interested in collapse collapsing those boundaries yeah. and collapsing eras really and that's that definitely what I was trying to do in the book with you're not quite sure what era you're in is it the 70s but then there's there's uh, references to other things that weren't there and then yeah. there's the futuristic sort of side of ghosts and spirits or are they real or are they not I think as children it doesn't matter any of that does it we don't have boundaries so when you're when you're playing in, in your imaginary world, whatever you're creating, that's the truth, mm. right there. And um, I also think as, as a, being able to have been a creative artist all my life, I haven't had to make boundaries because yeah. you need that creativity to be free yeah. all the time. If you're creating a song, a drawing, a poem. And so I still feel like I'm exploring the imaginary world and it is not separate from my real world yeah and you have total freedom right to, to create the ingredients of that blend as, uh, and translating it into an aesthetic thing Cause like i think with the walnut whips and the petrol and the kind of the realities mixed in with the folkloric are utterly bespoke to you or and to the characters in the book and no one can police that Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't fit into any way of describing a rural idyll or, you know, a realistic portrait of modern life. It's, it's a song. It, it's mm. closer to trying to accurately transcribe the music of a place. Yes, yeah, the music, the scent of it, the, the touch, the feel. I feel like all of them will become its own... You know, I'll, I'll see something which is beautiful but also pretty disgusting and I'll be like, that's very all am. <laughs> you know, I think yeah. that, that unique yeah. sweet spot between the kind of tender and the repellent and the industrial and the rural and the violent and, and, the, and the, the haunted is really, mm. really singular. Mm. You've created something very singular. I have to let you get on with the reading, but can I quickly, because it's interesting for people, could I just quickly get you to talk about the dialect and William, tell everybody who William Barnes is? Yeah, so William Barnes is the most famous Dorset dialect poet. Um, but he was also absolutely fascinated with the language and he collected and made a dictionary of the Dorset dialect and as well as a dictionary of all these words, he collected all the phrases that he could. Um, and you can still buy that dictionary. It's one of the books you have to order and they make it for you. But that was what helped me write this book. I based it all on his dictionary. Um, and yeah, and what a beautiful poet. I mean, I read his entire collection, so it's some very beautiful, very moving poems. And, and it came so naturally to me because of, you know, having grown up there. Yeah. Although I wasn't that familiar with the, the, the breadth and depth of the dialect when I started, by the end of writing all of I did know it like a second language and can now read Barnes without needing to translate it in any oh, way. Really? It's, uh, the glossary in the book is a beautiful work of art unto itself, I think. I love to just sit down and let some of it wash over me. And what I like about that is that that's what, what I was talking about with the, with the work that you've done, is that this... Think how many dialects have been lost, and you've sort of brought it back mm. from extinction, but made it profoundly relevant to our present concerns mm. as well. And there's a kind of... That can't be faked, that effort. That can't be done quickly in a rush. That has to be carefully excavated word by word and placed into the you know, in this instance, the kind of psychosexual complexity of childhood, mm. which you're not romanticising, you're really investigating. Well, it's been an absolute honour oh, to hear you. you read, and I'm sorry I've missed what's behind us, because I'm sure it's also <laughs> very beautiful. Um, I'm going to let you do your second Thank you. Bit. Thanks very much, Max. No worries. Thank you.